I first met Mike um, in in Persia. So we, so uh, Terry O'Donoghue and I w- went to see a guy called David Mail, who it was the probably still is the lean manager for Peugeot UK. And Mike was doing some work on IT with with um, with, with with David, and. Um, he started telling us about this low code, this idea of developing apps and doing it without any code. And that actually people at the front line could develop these apps to make their work easier. And I thought, gee, where's this, you know, there's no way I'm going to be able to do that. That's way beyond my pay grade. But I got quite interested in all of this. And we actually ran a couple of experiments with Halfway where basically um, guys managing processors develop their own apps and even to the uh, and, we, and we shared that at the 2018 summit in Manchester and quite a few people came up to us after and said oh I'm going to try this and you know they, they started um, experimenting with uh, uh, platforms like NAC and uh, there was a platform called Integramat which has now become Make um, and automating different steps of processes and putting all these things together and Mike's it's, fa- it's fascinating, this stuff, because, of course, the more you do of this and the, and the more you learn about what's going on uh, in this kind of space, uh, the more you realise, actually, it's a massive Kaizen opportunity for lots and lots of people. And so uh, I've asked Mike to come and talk to us about this world of Kaizen, AI, and all of this low-code, no-code stuff. So when I last presented at this event six years ago, I think, I described this emerging technology that David just mentioned, um, which would help companies empower their staff to do better Kaizen and liberate them from the constraints that were imposed on them by their traditional uh, computer systems. It was a long time ago, I guess, and I'm sure those of you who were here don't remember, but I talked about the, the challenges of getting the custom software that you needed to support your Kaizen initiatives and lean experiments built. And I talked about how difficult it was to harness your company's IT resources to create applications quickly and to be responsive to your uh, evolving needs. Now we all recognize that the corporate software, uh, um, that corporate software development is a tough space and they suffer from inertia and they have large backlogs of of work, which often prevents them from being responsive to your short-term needs. It's not that they don't want to be helpful, it's that they can't. So then I described a technology that might even allow you to avoid your internal IT department altogether and to become self-sufficient as far as um, building apps to support your work is concerned, or at least some kind of apps. And that technology, uh, no code, so that technology, no code, is all about putting the capability to create software apps into the hands of the people who are actually doing the work. In other words, empowering your staff to build the software that they need to support the work that they're doing themselves rapidly and with complete flexibility. So the big idea was to create citizen developers. It's a type of worker that could equip themselves with the tools that they need to uh, facilitate problem solving uh, at the Gemba. Tools which would be better than the Excel spreadsheets which typically had been used to, to solve this kind of problem and to support this kind of work. In fact, my workshop was called Ditch the Spreadsheet. And those of you who came along might remember that I built a couple of applications in response to audience member suggestions. Um, we actually went through a few iterations of the, of the PDCA cycle over about two, two and a half hours. We started off by creating a basic app, just as a proof of concept. Then I put the app into the hands of the audience through their mobile phones. And then we listened to the feedback and we made a few changes and refined the product until we had something that we thought could, could add value. And then we kind of released it as, as an MVP, a minimum viable product. That was successful. Everyone seemed impressed. But what I really wanted to show in that session 
was that no-code platforms could be harnessed by anyone, well, at least anyone with a basic understanding of the problem that they were trying to solve. And it didn't even need to be a good understanding of the problem. Because the process of building an app using no code not only gets you a step closer to the solution with each iteration, but actually closer to a better understanding of the problem itself. And this is a really, really important concept in no code, that you can refine and improve your understanding of the problem you're trying to solve by using what knowledge you do have to build a tool to help solve that problem. It's a bit like how an apprentice carpenter can understand joint making better by building the box joint jig that they need first. So by designing and building the jig, the geometry of the joinery it will be used for becomes clearer. And this is one of the big differences between building an app yourself as a citizen developer and asking the software development team in IT to do it for you because when they eventually deliver what they think you asked for, which was what you thought you needed at the time, and you're at the Gemba and it doesn't work, you probably don't know why or, or what to do about it. So in that workshop, um, I wanted to prove that, that no code wasn't just an empty claim, that you really could build an app with no coding skills at all, and in fact no knowledge really of, of computer systems other than a basic understanding of data organization, the sort of understanding you, you need to use Excel, you know, rows and columns and that kind of thing. And a few of you, well, quite a few of you, um, were excited by, by the potential for this kind of tool, and especially by the idea that you wouldn't be constrained by the in, inflexibility inherent in your incumbent ERP or CRM or, or, or MRP systems or bogged down by the friction that's just always inherent in trying to get your internal IT people to build these tools for you. So, what's happened since then? Well, back in, in 2018, I felt a bit like a pioneer evangelizing about how no code would help us all become more productive and how it would liberate us from the, the shackles of traditional IT and how we would all learn by, by problem solving in a virtuous um, techie kaizen sort of way. Did that happen? And by and large, the answer is yes. Quick Google search um, shows us that most, if not all, of the world's major corporations are already adopting this technology, whether it's application building or systems integration where no-code tools um, can connect systems together to allow data to flow seamlessly from, say, your, your online store to your fulfillment. I'm looking at Dave because he's doing this exact thing at the moment with no-code tools in his organization. And what I'm seeing is that the people doing this work are often citizen developers. In other words, they, they have um, day jobs too. Engineers, accountants, um, administrators, even the CEO of the Lean Enterprise Academy. In other words, the people who um, understand the work best are building the automation and data management tools that they need to do their work better and more productively. And of course, we're not living in a, in a digital utopia just yet. The revolution is, is, is definitely not without its challenges. Um, governance is still important. And look, I'm advocating for democratization, to use your word of the day, not, not for anarchy. Uh, it's not that I want you to be lurking around in the shadows, building apps in secret, you know, what, what your chief technology officer might call shadow IT. No. Applications need to be secure, data needs to be kept confidential or private when appropriate, um, and citizen developed solutions must perform, and the information stored within them has to be accurate and aligned with other data sources in the business. These things continue to be important, but they're not unsurmountable challenges with this technology. And what I'm seeing now is that applications built using no code are usually not replacing enterprise-wide ERP or MRP systems, but augmenting them. 
There are exceptions, of course. Some ambitious users, such as my client, uh, who Dave mentioned earlier, the automotive manufacturer Stellantis in the UK, uh, they've developed no-code solutions so successfully that their software application footprint has reduced by 70%. So specifically, at Stellantis, the business functions that had previously required 11 different systems are now performed by three commercial software packages and a single application built by their own citizen developers using no-code tools that, that takes care of everything else, in effect replacing eight, eight systems. So just to be clear, I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, an application that was built by Stellantis's IT team, but by a team made up of employees from all over the business, led by a guy Dave, Dave just mentioned called David Mayle, whose day job was um, head of lean transformation when you met him. And now, interestingly enough, his title is just head of, head of transformation. So it's a real life success story. Um, and it looks to me like no code is, is here to stay. And why do I think that? Well, five, six years ago, when I was last here, the main players in the sector were companies you'd never heard of. Dave mentioned a couple of them, NAC, uh, Betty Block, Zapier, Integromat, QuickBase. And while these businesses are still, still there, uh, and in fact thriving, there are now other more notable um, players investing billions of dollars in, into the same space. Oracle, Salesforce, Zoho, Google, Microsoft, household names, all promoting their own no-code tools. So that's what's happened in the wider world since 2018. Things move quickly, don't they? Um, and I'd be interested to know when we have our little Q&A session at the end, um, what projects you guys might have, have got involved with using this technology. Perhaps some of you are now involved in, in, in building Microsoft Power Apps, for example. I don't know, you might be using Power Automate to automate workflows. I'd like to hear about it. But I'm actually even more interested uh, to understand some of the reasons why you haven't taken advantage of this technology now that it's mainstream. What stopped you? What's held you back, if indeed you have been held back? Um, I'm genuinely curious, and so maybe we can pick this up during the Q&A. Okay, so, if you didn't see the no-code revolution coming, or you were too busy editing Excel spreadsheets to, uh, to devote any time to it, you'll have no such excuses for missing the next upheaval. And, of course, I'm talking about AI, probably the hottest of hot topics uh, in the corridors and around the water coolers uh, of business at the moment. So in many ways, AI represents the or kind of natural evolution of, of no-code automation. If its proponents are to be believed, and, and I'm one of them, not only do you not need to learn how to write code, you don't need to learn how to write at all. AI will do it for you and plenty of other stuff too from uh, analyzing unstructured data to devising online marketing strategies to even figuring out what the mood uh, of your company in your company is at any given time. So it seems there's no, um, no area of business or, or indeed life um, where I, AI won't have an impact. So how are we to react to this potentially overwhelming avalanche of, of AI tools and the changes that they will bring. How, how might our work be impacted? And both David and Peter asked the same question. And what does it even mean for, for Kaizen and, and for lean thinking? So let's start here. When I talk to my clients about AI, I invariably find one of these three reactions, fear and denial. It's always the first, first sort of stage then skepticism and frustration, and then, in some cases, uh, acceptance and excitement. And it's hardly surprising that people feel fearful and want to deny that AI will have any impact on them or their business. We seem to be living in a kind of a, kind of a gold rush with lots of claims. And they can't all be true. 
right? Um, those that claim AI will, repra will replace 300 million jobs, as the BBC reported at the end of last year, a claim forwarded by a Goldman Sachs analyst. And surely they must be making claims that can't really be substantiated. Well, the thing about a gold rush is, yes, there are lots of claims, but there is also gold. And my duty as a consultant is to handhold clients and, and colleagues through that fear and denial phase to the skepticism and frustration phase and eventually uh, to the acceptance and perhaps even the excitement phase. And incidentally, one of, one of the ways of um, helping this transition is, is to recognize that even the term artificial intelligence is problematic and easily understood. And um, Mustafa Suleiman, who's a co-founder of DeepMind, one of the most influential voices in, in this sphere, recommends using the term machine learning when having everyday discussions. It could be a good way of de-threatening de the discourse, really. Because, you know, it's not obvious to everyone that artificial intelligence is not synonymous with artificial consciousness. Nobody is actually saying that AI can, can think in the way that humans think, at, at least not yet. So it's better to think of AI or machine learning as a tool in the way that no code is a tool, but it's, it's a tool with immense potential. Just like Jethro Tull's horse-drawn sea drill in the 18th century, nobody realized that they needed it until they saw it. And then within a few years, nobody could conceive of running a profitable farm without it. And like all tools, one needs a certain amount of skill, skill that needs to be acquired through learning and practice. And I'm, I mean, I wasn't there, I'm, I'm old, I'm not that old, but I'm pretty sure that the first few furrows seeded by Toll's drill were uneven and of poor quality. But I'm sure those who dedicated time to mastering the machine were rewarded, whether they were rewarded uh, as the landowners were with, with higher profits, or the machine operators themselves who were rewarded by keeping their jobs. So if we think of AI as another tool, which I think we must, we can see that the challenge is actually learning to use it, that is acquiring the knowledge and the skill to deploy it effectively because, um, and make no mistake, you, you will be provided with this tool. If it hasn't happened already, then one day in the not too distant future, and probably before we all meet again for the next Lean Summit, someone will arrive at your desk with an AI tool and you will be expected to make use of it if you haven't already done so. So for many of you, it'll be Microsoft's Copilot or perhaps ChatGPT, maybe even Google's uh, Gemini. You may already be using some of these. But even if you are, you are likely only scratching the surface of its capabilities at the moment. I know I am, and I was an early adopter. So AI, I think, is here to stay. I think we'd all agree. Um, those, of it, those of us that are going to thrive in this new workplace will be those that learn to direct it, not necessarily understand it. I'll come on to the reasons why in a minute, but learn to direct it. And especially those of you who've got the imagination to see novel uses for it in, in sort of everyday conventional work, that I think is going to be the key. Especially successful will be those of you who recognize AI's limitations, who learn to discern what tasks are ideally suited to it and which are better suited to human beings. That's a skill in itself, and it's, it's, it's actually a skill I'm really only just starting to, to learn myself. When and how and under what circumstances will AI let you down? When can't it be trusted to get things right? And conversely, when can we rely on it? And when should we rely on it? So my strong recommendation is to embark on your AI voyage of discovery right now. As soon as you leave the summit, or even tonight in your hotel room, there's so much to learn, it's difficult to know where the optimal starting point is. And when I'm asked the question, where do I start? I usually say, actually, it doesn't matter. Optimal learning isn't the point. 
And in any case, the technology is moving so quickly that what was a good starting point last week probably isn't the best place to, to start now. So learn about AI for the sake of learning about AI. Watch YouTube videos, research the history of machine learning, read interviews with people like Mustafa Suleiman or Jeffrey Hinton, the, the godfather of deep learning. Start interacting with the free versions of the tools, such as ChatGPT 3.5. I'm sure most of you have had a play with it. Or even Google Gemini. Be careful, it's still a little bit problematic. Actually, it doesn't really matter where you start. It doesn't matter what path you take for now. You'll quickly discover things that you can use, and then your journey will transform into one where you can start to problem solve. And we all know... Uh, learning by problem solving is one of the best things we can do to equip ourselves for the future. So, assuming we decide to embrace the AI revolution, what can we expect from it? What might AI do for us from a lean perspective? How might our Kaizen efforts be impacted by these new tools? Why are you reading that like that mic? I gave that challenge to an AI. I thought it would be fun. So I gave the AI the presentation that I've just read, out, just read out to you. And then I literally typed in this sentence. And here's what it replied. Hi, my name is Kai. And I'm an AI avatar created by Mike to help with this presentation. Thanks for inviting me to the Lean Summit 2024. It's great to be here to talk to you about how AI can help with Kaizen. So, Mike let me read the first part of his presentation, then asked me to think about ways in which AI might assist lean practitioners, especially in the area of Kaizen, or continuous improvement. Here are some ideas I had. First, data-driven Gember walks. Second, automated root cause analysis. And third, predictive maintenance. Then fourth, continuous improvement recommendations. And finally, automated data collection and analysis. Imagine an AI assistant accompanying you on Gember walks, analyzing real-time data from sensors and connected machines to highlight anomalies, inefficiencies, and potential improvement opportunities. It could identify patterns invisible to the human eye, suggesting areas for further investigation and data collection. Are you struggling to pinpoint the root cause of a problem? AI can analyze vast amounts of historical data, process logs, and even employee feedback to identify correlations and suggest likely culprits. This can significantly reduce troubleshooting time and effort, allowing you to focus on implementing solutions. AI can analyze equipment sensor data to predict potential failures before they occur. This allows for proactive maintenance, preventing costly downtime and production disruptions, a key aspect of lean manufacturing. By learning from historical Kaizen events and successes, AI can suggest new improvement opportunities tailored to your specific context. It can even personalize recommendations based on individual employee skills and interests, fostering a culture of continuous learning and engagement. Tedious data collection and analysis tasks can be automated by AI, freeing up valuable time for lean practitioners to focus on higher level analysis, interpretation, and action planning. This encourages data-driven decision-making, while reducing the burden of manual data handling. AI does what it is best at, and the people are provided with the information to allow them to do what humans are good at. I'm going to hand over to Mike again. He will probably tell you that this was just a bit of theater. But remember this, I actually wrote this section on Kaizen myself. And when I say myself, I actually mean ChatGPT, of course. All Mike did was let me read the first part of his presentation and ask me to write the last part on practical applications in Kaizen myself. I'm not a lean expert, obviously, but I am an AI with access to all the content online that refers to lean and Kaizen. And I have the ability to infer facts and context from all of this information. But in the end, I'm just a tool and it's up to you whether you make use of me or not. You get to decide. For now. Thanks, Kai. So, is, is Kai going to be running everything? Is, is he 
the answer to all of our management problems, let alone our Kaizen challenges? I think right now the answer is an equivocal no. Um, and let me just for a minute or two switch into my natural mode of cautious optimism. Because there are reasons why we should actually be skeptical of some of the claims made for AI and why we should be cautious in how we deploy it, especially while the technology and while we are in the, the immature phase. So firstly, um, <clears throat> bias and fairness. AI mirrors our world, or at least the parts of it that it can see, which means it's going to mirror the biases hidden in our data. And we have to try and ensure that AI rectifies these biases rather than amplifying and replicating them. And an interesting example of this sort of bias uh, was found in the facial recognition, uh, <clears throat> facial recognition software that our phones use when, um, when they're trying to figure out if you are really you. And a study carried out by an MIT, MIT Media Lab researcher called Joy Boilamwini found that the facial analysis algorithms had an error rate of under 1% for light-skinned men. But for dark-skinned women, the error rate was 38%. Now, this issue has, has been resolved. The issue was caused by bias in the sample data that was fed in to train the AI model in the first place. So we need to be careful. Then we've got the challenge of transparency and explainability. Unfortunately, AI's complexity means that it's often impossible to figure out how it's arrived at a particular response or result. And it's really interesting to me as somebody with, with a background in, in information systems that we're now at a place where even the computer scientists who design the AI algorithms and the software engineers who build the models and train them can't explain how an AI has arrived at a particular answer. It's referred to as a black box problem. And I think it's one of the reasons why you won't see this kind of AI, generative AI certainly, managing safety critical systems such as air traffic control, uh, certainly not in the near future. So can we even trust AI to be right? I mean, it sounds like a, an obvious question, but the short answer is, well, no, not necessarily. It seems that in some situations, AI is all too human in its propensity to get things wrong. And there are lots of reasons for this, and we don't have time to explore them now, because um, I think I've only got another two hours, Dave. Is that right? So I'm restricted. Um, but the key takeaway is that there are things we should definitely not ask AI to take care of. And there are things we can ask AI to do as long as we're skilled in our use of it. And this skill that I'm referring to is now rather grandly uh, being called prompt uh, engineering. Uh, I'm sure the engineers feel a bit miffed that their title has been hijacked. Um, prompt engineering is, is probably the critical success factor. It's essentially the art and the science of crafting effective inputs or, or, or prompts to get the best possible outputs from AI models, particularly those based on language, like, like ChatGPT, you know, the LLMs or large language models. Um, and I am running out of time. And I've only just got started on the interesting stuff. So let me leave you with this. AI is not a magic bullet. It's just like the no-code technology that I previewed here five or six years ago. It's a tool. And it's a tool that should complement, not replace, human ingenuity, expertise, and critical thinking. All the skills essential for successful Kaizen or actually any other business endeavor, really. Yes, there are some things that AI is just better at. Consuming massive amounts of data and then inferring stuff from it, for example. But even that process needs direction. And that's where we come in. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for the latest lean content.